now move on to the sessions for the day. The topic for the first session is culturally appropriate mental health literacy in India. This session will be chaired by Professor Abha Singh from Institute of Integrated Learning and Management University. Professor Abha Singh is the director, IILM Center for Emotional Intelligence. She has been honored with Ambassador for Peace Award at the International Leadership Conference, Seoul, Korea in 2007 by Universal Peace Federation. She was also awarded with Peacemaker Award 2017 on the occasion of International Peace Day on 21st September 2017 by Global Peace and Prosperity Initiative USA. Welcome and over to you, ma'am. Greetings of peace and happiness to one and all. I am Professor Dr. Abha Singh, Director ILM Center for Emotional Intelligence and Chair of PhD program, IILM University, Gurugram, Delhi, NCR. I heartily welcome all my esteemed panelists and curious participants to this Mental Health Literacy Project Dissemination Conference this day of 25th October, 2021. We all know the importance, relevance, and criticality of mental health in India and worldwide. I don't have to tell you the data, it is alarming. In our country, India, it was already a pandemic and worldwide. And if we see the budget of mental health, it is very, very minuscule. I am raising a policy question here. I think you will be alarmed to know what is the India budget for mental health care. 0.05%. The one twelfth of the budget of worldwide for mental health care. And I really congratulate the organizer, Professor Dr. Raghu and team for organizing this important conference on this topic and I learned from him what Professor Raghu told me in first meeting that mental health literacy means mental health awareness and action. I'm thankful to Professor Raghu for educating me and I, I do a lot of mental health awareness program. Now I'm talking mental health literacy Professor Raghu and that's what the change in the mind of all psychologists first, it should happen. And then we can reach the unreached. Without taking much time, I would like to inform the August participants the topic of the panel discussion, which is culturally appropriate mental health literacy in India. Before I invite my panelists, one important point I would like to inform because we all are educated community here. When we have to conduct any research, you know, we look for culturally fair test. You know? And when it comes to advocacy and awareness, we just cut copy paste. And that's where this conference is trying to give us the model and teach us and create an awareness for action model, how to take this mental health advocacy and literacy culturally relevant and culturally appropriate so that our outcome is to the large extent we are reaching the unreached. So now I would like to invite all my elite panelists who have given their valuable time 
I thank them for joining us on this important day of panel discussion. First, I would like to introduce Professor Asha Banu, who is from TIS Mumbai, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, we all know, it is a very important institute. She is going to talk on more on mental health, care for all, making it a reality. Then we have Professor Raghu, we all know him from D. Montfort University, mental health professor. Keep on telling us why mental health literacy is important. Thank you so much, Professor. And he is going to talk more on culturally appropriate mental health literacy. Here I would like to make one point, Professor. This is how we got connected. You know, I think I did a lot of program in mental health awareness in Delhi NCR, Noida Belt. Some of you must be knowing it. And I reached six villages. And there we did a, a street play, Nukarnata. And that's what the creative model, I was not knowing that I'm using creative model, but through interaction of Professor Raghu, I came to, I did a scientific work and I will share that report with you, uh, Professor. And we did a research finding on that. And you will not believe that creative method through street play, after conducting street play, immediately students used to come and say, man, the, uh, the villagers want counseling from us, you know? So that's the effect. I think we agree on that point. That's how I think I thought, like, let me join this great event of yours. Then we have Professor Dr. Naidu. Uh, again, Sri Zenka, please uh, pardon me for pronunciation, D. Montfort University, UK. Her topic is Interdisciplinary Methodology for Mental Health Literacy Project, India Project, focused on India Project. Then we have Dr. Ananda Wilson. D. Montfort University, UK, Dr. Sanjana Kumar, Archa Gauri, Verma, research team along with her. Mental health use, her topic is mental health user, family career, neighborhood perspective from urban, rural, and tribal community. So here we go. We start with Professor Asha Banu. Over to you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon and good evening to all the participants of the conference and to the panelists and to the chair. I, I hope I'm audible and I'm doing the screen share. We have five to seven minutes for that. I hope it's okay. And participants, please give your uh, comments on chat, ask questions. Yeah. Okay, so this is my presentation. I'll start. Um, the, to the topic is making it a reality and I wanted to put a question mark, but then I wanted to be really optimistic and Raghu has taught that, you know, everything is possible. So I've removed the question mark here. And in order to make it a reality, it's always important to understand the mental health landscape. So I want to take you all through the mental health landscape in India. First, it's Mental Health Care Act. Some of the highlights I wanted to share with you all. India takes pride because India's 2017 Act is the first piece of mental health legislation in the world drafted explicitly to accord with the conventions of rights of persons with disability. It includes a right to mental health care and broad social rights for the persons with mental illness. And Article 18.1 talks about every person shall have a right to access mental health care and treatment from mental health services run or funded by the appropriate government. It also assures services to support family of persons with mental illness and home-based rehabilitation. It also talks about the targeted interventions to promote child mental health services, geriatric mental health services, also talks about establishment of government authorities to monitor and oversee services and also to look at mental health review boards to review admissions and other matters. So these are only the salient features and highlights. And I'm going back. This is the policy. These are the provisions. And also it talks about mental health care as a right. And I'm going towards the second aspect, which is crucial, which is financing. And I'm not going to take much time, but I want to really highlight and want the attendees to focus on the percentage, 1.30%. And also, my, is not moving. my slide right. is not moving. Yeah. Now? We are still in the first slide. 
okay? Thank you for pointing that out. Is it visible yeah. now? Yeah. Okay, I think I'll go. I'll not do the slide screen. So I'm talking about the mental health care resources. And here I'm looking at the mental health financing. This is from the Mental Health Atlas WHO. How the majority of persons with mental disorders pay for mental health services in India, it is still pay mostly or entirely out of pocket for services and medicines. And the total government spending is 1.30 percentage. And we look at the human resources for mental health map for the country. It says total number of mental health professionals, it's 25,312. And the number of child psychiatrists, including governmental and non-governmental organization is 49. The source again is Mental Health Atlas. Now I want to take you to the next slide. This is very important because you can see that how the psychiatrist per 10,000 population in 2011 has come down to 0 0.03 from 0 0.20 in 2005 and 0 0.4 in 2001. So 0 0.4 in 2001 and 0 0.3 in 2005 and we have dropped down to 0 0.03. So that definitely indicates the load on the specialized care services. Now, I spoke about financing, spoke about policy, and the third is facilities. Now, all of us are aware that we have 47 government-funded psychiatric institutions, and there are 89 private, again, source mental health atlas, and there are 389 general hospital psychiatric units, and also 45 inpatient facility for children and adolescents. Now, I want to really highlight that the resources are unevenly distributed with few districts not having any of the above mentioned facilities. Until today, people have to try travel miles to reach the facility. So access and inequity becomes a concern here. Now, moving on to the fourth dimension, district mental health program initiated and launched in 1982. Two, Nimhans has taken a lead, replicated several models. It's basically aspiring to provide minimum mental health care to all in alignment with the policy goals. Directs that knowledge about mental health must be applied in general health care. Here, again, we can see the state level disparities where Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka have efficient models with 100% coverage across all the districts, where in certain areas where even state mental health authorities are not even Formed. The boards are not formed. The fifth dimension in the landscape is the community based models. There are diverse innovations in the field and diverse perspectives starting from recovery, rehab, rights, governing the models of intervention in the country. There are several organizations and even two of our collaborators, Mehek and Yemhat in Kerala, are also working in collaboration with the government, implementing DMHP in certain contexts, running community clinics across several districts in Kerala. Now, the fifth dimension I want to highlight is traditional healing practices. In India, we have rich mosaic of indigenous practices and also Indian systems of medicine like Ayurveda also is focusing on healing persons with mental illness because we are located in Kerala. We have seen psychiatric pluralism. And in the Indian context, one of the models that is again and again highlighted is the collaborative model, which is called the Dava and Dubai in Gujarat where amalgamation of faith and science, because the, the clinic, the DMHP program operates from a popular darga in Gujarat. So going to the next point, users network, because they are the pillars, but where in our country are their voices? And if at all we are looking out, there are only few voices visible and vocal. Now going to the next slide. Now, if we have to make it a reality, the, the easiest theme is mental health in an unequal world. Now, we are looking at two sets of population. There are needs of persons with mental illness, and there are needs of persons suffering inequities and exclusion. So there is a social causation pathwork, pathway, because as social practitioners, we often talk about the determinants, and the determinants play a key role in causation, and there is a causal pathway. And there is also social selection where persons with mental illness, because they do not have 
enough resources they go forward they just go in a downward spiral and fall into uh, you know a vulnerable group so the resources are mostly earmarked for the downstream interventions like if you are looking at the landscape you can clearly understand the resources are not looking at the social causation pathway but again it looks at only needs of persons with mental illness but that too with a clinical dimension if at all we are looking at recovery what are some of the mechanisms that are put forth for recovery is a big question mark of course policy has provisions but in the implementation there is a gap resources to envisage rights of users and agency building is also negligible and also when i was looking at research resource research studies that are looking at inequities i couldn't find many and that way if you're looking and talking about public mental health or upstream interventions where are we going to locate without any research so this is an important insight when i was going through the landscape now when i'm looking when we're looking at determinants and inequities you can see very clearly in the slide the social causation or the social factors form 55% but for too long we have equated healthcare or mental health care exclusively with the amount of quality of medical care and there becomes the disconnect i have also put a cartoon this is from sochara organization where i would prescribe a syrup for your cough but then there are so many social determinants that are there without addressing this social determinants or understanding this determinants in a contextual context we will not be able to achieve any further dimensions so this is one other research study it's between 1990 to 2016 the study outcomes in the health inequalities research mental health inequities only 3% of the study focused on inequities mental health inequities now mental health research on inequities becomes the key and that's going to be the argument for my talk today in a country as diverse as india with large social inequalities research on mental inequalities as a special significance for policy and programs research on under represented population with a focus on mental health is inevitable to explore inequities and determinants like gender caste religion and occupation in a given social context that affect the mental health and quality of life should inform public mental health practice need to build context specific mental health literacy is also very important now often we talk about this sustainable development goals in order to achieve sdgs in order to envisage convention of rights of persons with disabilities address treatment gaps gaps promote recovery models and public mental health i have listed this urgent need for interdisciplinary research that means we have to move beyond the biomedical models emphasis on rights and recovery agency building through emancipatory work co creation and co construction of culturally socially relevant context specific knowledge building and mental health literacies i always like this article 19 this is to promote to enhance community living of persons with mental illness for all of these users voices become very critical and point 1 2 3 builds towards envisaging article 19 so while talking this it's like it's, it's important to share with you that the project the current project today all of us are going to share so passionately has built in this bottom up knowledge through emancipatory practices and we have definitely covered the voices of users carers community in a given socio cultural context and what we have gained we have listened to their stories and through their stories we have understood what is the treatment gap gap or what is treatment trajectories and what are the pathways is it religion to indian system of medicine to biomedical or from a community clinic to a different setting what is the kind of interaction between these many players also the stories talks about the stigma and discrimination in that cultural context also talks about financial implications it also talks about the opportunity costs of the caregivers it also talks about exclusion and this is an insight over the period of 3 years that determinants are also super contextual and it is important and also it is important i think this study 
or the project is so important because we are building this entire understanding from the users' voices and users from the diverse context, that's urban, rural, and tribal. So it's, it's, it's a wealth of information and definitely it is possible to influence policy and programs from a bottom-up user perspective. So I, I could again look at the Socharas where there is awareness building, enabling local health systems and also demystification. All of this happened during the process of our data collection. So with this, my team members will take over and we can deliberate more. Thank you so much. I'll stop here. Ma'am, you're muted. Thank you, Dr. Asha. I think it was a really lucid illustration of your scientific findings on the project. And one word to manage time, I must say, we have to look for inclusive mental public mental health model. And that's where we need to debate. And let's hear from other uh, panelists, uh, great Professor Raghu, who is the initiator on this. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Asha. Thank you, um, panel. Uh, now let me share the slides. Uh, audience, keep noting your questions. We'll have 10 minutes discussion on question answer. Okay. So thank you very much. This is um, um, Professor Asha has outlined the context in which the, um, the Indian mental health um, the question about mental health services. And also she beautifully put in relation to how the bottom up approach of mental health users, carers and the community members need to be the integral part of how we use expertise um, and how we shape policy. So in that light, I think this is actually, um, this project is about culturally appropriate mental health literacy in India. And then I'll talk about how this all came about and the team and our key objectives. This is actually the Kerala focus, but I think it's got major implications in from the pan-India pan -India context. So um, our, we have a diverse team. Uh, we, this is truly an interdisciplinary uh, uh, project. Uh, with UK and Indian scholars uh, sharing the knowledge and practices together. So we, um, and, and that's how we have actually come together after three years of actually making, creating this, co-creating this knowledge with communities um, and other professionals um, uh, as well. So we also work with a number of other partners as well within Kerala um, and um, in the theater partners because we have actually used applied theater as a, as a methodology um, and also the NGOs um, and digital and social media consultants and, and, and film directors um, and then quite a number of other creative artists as well. And you will be able to see some of those work in our lobby um, and also through the next three days of conversations and dialogue, I'm sure the whole how this all came together will be highlighted much more in further discussions. So from the India context, uh, mental health of India, over 90 million Indians um, or 7.5% of the country's population of 1.3 billion actually suffer from some form of mental health disorder. Um, that's also the WHO. It also, WHO also estimates that the economic loss um, due to mental health conditions between 2012 and 2030 will be 1.03 trillions of US dollars in the Indian context. So uh, recently, the kind of an uh, poll actually said about the happiest nations uh, around the world finds Indian, uh, the mental health, mental health being of India uh, is actually declining. So the digitalization, the pandemic and the urbanization um, are thought to have increased levels of anxiety and, and stress throughout the Indian um, uh, states and context really. So if you look at the poll state of India, uh, there are you know there are some of the Western nations, Scandinavian nations, there is about 59% um, of the people think uh, that mental health is the key uh, part here and also 27% in India, um, as he talks about mental health um, is one of the 
key area, top areas of problems that should be looked at from a wider country health perspective. As the WHO says, there is no health without mental health. It's important that we actually focus on mental health. And mental health is a social construct from, from many respects as well, not necessarily a blind following of the Western medical models of mental health and psychiatry. So the Indian context, um, this, is, uh, this is an important uh, piece of uh, data that I came across um, in terms of awareness and health literacy are two sides of the same coin. We keep arguing about that. But uh, most importantly about young people, because the, young, the next generation of India, um, the next future citizens of India and the future creativity of India. And I think it's important that the systematic review uh, in 2020, looking at stigma associated with mental health of young people in India. In this systematic review, it actually look, looked at most of the Indians, uh, most of the studies, about 66%, focused on youth um, training to become health professionals. And, and one third of the young people here uh, displayed poor uh, knowledge of mental health problems and negative attitude towards people with mental health problems. And one in five had actual intended stigmatizing behavior uh, towards uh, uh, mental ill health. Um, and young people um, are also unable to recognize the causes and symptoms of mental health problems and believe that recovery is unlikely. So people, and also in this, this um, study also points out that people with mental health problems are perceived as dangerous and irresponsible. So I think it is it is time that we uh, walk across and walk through this um, uh, uh, these kind of belief systems that people may actually have, and I think look at the reality. Um, and I think that's where the Me Help India project, which is actually based in Kerala, comes into life in terms of how we talk to people, how we understand culturally appropriate mental health literacy, and how is it that we can actually impact that, with, um, we can actually shape it up, we can actually uh, increase the impact uh, throughout the country in relation to our dialogues and future projects, etc. So the Kerala context is actually the, about nearly 14% of the national Indian context is about 13.4, about nearly 14% uh, of national prevalence of mental health disorders. It is worse in urban and, um, and um, in, in lower income areas as well. And the National Mental Health Survey of 2017 talks about that. So why Kerala? Because I think Kerala has got, um, you know, the, there is a success stories here, but I think this is a, this is the kind of area that where most of the other Indian states might want to wish to go in terms of inclusion, social development, um, primary health care development, et cetera. So the population of about 36 million people in, in, in Kerala, about 3% of India, and where the human health index is actually 0.79, which is the highest in India and also in par with many of the Western countries. Um, and also we have the literacy rate about 98% or nearly 100%. And the life expectancy of 70, 74 years and the highest in, in, in the country. So with that as a background, I think uh, and, and it, is, it is important that we look at the study that particular state, because that is an area where most of the other states are not actually going to travel into uh, in terms of the social, economic um, and other uh, environmental developments. So within the challenge, there are some challenges to the um, Kerala model. Um, Whereas regardless of all the kind of higher indices of, of things, um, of developments and, and, and literacy and primary health care developments, nearly 14.4% of the adult population experience mental health uh, once in their lifetime. And about 12.5% of the individuals with suicidal risk. Um, and I think this is actually double the national average of India. And depression is a lead cause here. Um, that's what many of the studies have actually found um, from time and time again in the Carolan context. Fast socioeconomic transformations, which actually reflects many of the Indian states as well. Decline of the joint family system and high standards of education and low employment and, low, and, and higher labor migration to other states. Internal migration is a major issue in India and also migration to other countries. And high expectations versus the harsh economic realities, which is very true um, in the COVID context as well. And alcohol consumption, uh, it is the, a major issue within the Kerala context, but I think it's also an issue within the pan-India context as well. And school pressure on, on children. And I think, you know, well, your people, children are actually uh, they're pushed to actually perform, perform and perform and not necessarily look at education, uh, education in the truest sense of the word as, as for a future citizen of India. So within that context, the COVID pandemic, uh, the mental health issues have actually gone up uh, over the last um, two years or so. Um, and I think we should need to look at that from the pan-India context too. There are a lot of stories that coming out um, in, 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 in the Indian context. 
So some of the existing solutions that we have, which uh, Professor Ash also touched on, is actually looking at some of the community-based um, models in mental health. We also have the psychiatric pluralism of um, biomedical, Ayurvedic, and religious healing practices. And stigma, I think it's it's a stigma as, as, the, as, the, as the previous slides actually show, stigma is a major issue with young people and adults and, old, and older people as well. And internalization of the public perceptions and resistant approach from the mental health facilities and mental illness as reflecting poorly on the family lineage, including marriage and economic prospects. So I think we need to kind of then look at mental health interventions that are responsive to local cultural, economic, and social contexts that are accessible and affordable. And I think a blind belief, a blind belief in Western psychiatric models alone will not actually do to actually promote mental health literacy. I think we need to be bold and go beyond that. Look what India has to offer. Look what the cultural dimensions of India. And I think it is in that context that our project in Kerala actually is actually stepping stone for the future in relation to how we actually look at mental health literacy from a broader spectrum and looking from the from the grassroots organizations up. So we used a novel applied theater, storytelling and short film methodology to explore and develop culturally appropriate um, and acceptable um, uh, mental health literacy narratives in Kerala in rural and urban communities. So this is truly a, a kind of a, a work with UK scholars and Indian scholars has actually started at the very beginning in terms of interdisciplinary model, because it is, it is important that we need to understand mental health from a truly interdisciplinary model. Because there is no one nation around the world that is actually developed in terms of mental health services. The Lancet survey um, in the last couple of years actually talked about all nations around the world are actually developing nations in relation to mental health and, and mental health care. So in that kind of context, I think we need to build capacity for future research of our international significance, which, is, which, which this project actually leads way to in social sciences and health humanities with reference to mental health, mental health literacy and well-being. And we worked with a number of organizations um, in this as to how we progressed about our aims and objectives. So culture, I keep talking about culture and culture is the key um, in relation to um, uh, understanding of mental health and mental illness. Um, and I think we need to kind of be looking at types of help people seek and coping styles and social supports and stigma are, are the key perspectives here. Um, and I think good mental health is integral part of a person's well-being and development. And you need this actually embedded in all aspects of our life, beliefs, the faith, culture, environment, spirituality, work, housing, education, family and community and respect. And I think there are differences between the low middle income countries, which India falls into currently, um, and also the high middle income countries as well. But I think it's important, to, as I said earlier on, to move away from the Western dimension or the Western psychiatric models and to try, try and bring together a kind of an Indian way of actually looking at things uh, with the existing evidence from the Western psychiatric models uh, as is, is the key uh, in how we move forward. So what is mental health literacy? Mental health literacy is actually characterized by, according to the Western way of actually looking at it from, um, uh, from, um, from Joe um, from Australia, he talks about the six dimensions and we wish to actually add the seventh dimension to it in terms of the cultural awareness and the cultural adaptation of mental health literacy to this context. So the ability to recognize specific disorders or different types of psychological distress, um, knowledge about risk factors and causes, and knowledge about self-help interventions, and knowledge about professional help available and attitudes that facilitate recognition, which is actually eradicating the stigma around mental uh, health and mental illness. Um, and again, knowledge about how to seek uh, mental health information. Again, the National Mental Health Survey of India also highlights that um, in relation to the need for mental health promotion, early recognition and the care support and the rights of the mental ill and destigmatization uh, of mental health and well-being. So, so our research is actually conducted looking at the feasibility of how best to promote socially and culturally appropriate mental health literacy using participatory approaches. So with that, um, we sort of looked at uh, various work packages that are actually involved, which um, my colleagues will actually talk through they are today and, and also tomorrow and, 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 and on Wednesday. Um, so it's understanding the lived experiences of mental ill health and pathways through services, which Professor Asha um, highlighted in, in her talk and developing applied theater and community interaction with some of it will be covered today and some of it will be covered tomorrow. 
and public engagement we when the pandemic came um you know we did not how how to actually engage with the community so we decided to actually go for a mental health film festival which actually be you know, enabling young people to actually communicate with us about their concepts and their ideas about mental health and well-being we also have a novel um, mental health literacy questionnaire that is currently available in English and also in Malayalam, which we uh, aim to actually be translated and adapted to other Indian languages as well. We also work with the digital stories based on cultural narratives um, from, the, from the interviews that we have conducted. And I'm sure we can, we can actually expand on that from the pan-India perspective. We currently have about 18 short films which have English subtitles based on cultural mental health literacy promotion, which is available um, in, in the lobby as well. So together, um, all these things um, are resources, um, rich resources, rich layers of uh, which might actually prompt rich layers of conversations around mental health and mental health literacy uh, in the Indian context. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dr. Raghu. Very important point came from your deliberation. And I'm happy to see mental health literacy questionnaire, which I was raising point. So you have given us scientific tool, which is culturally conducive and contextual. And one important point I can draw attention because mostly you have done so many points, but one point I can take it forward for all of us that uh, we can have a film festival competition on mental health because you have 18 films from one state, you know. So we have so many states in our country, you know. We can have a big event on this and you know, a film festival kind. And what a great day to see and you know the culture of the mental health from those films. Let's come to the next speaker, Professor Nadia, I think. Over to you, Professor Nadia. Thank you very much. Uh, not a professor yet, but one day. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. much. <laughs> um, and let me just share my slides and thank everybody for, so for joining us today. For Mental Health Literacy India Project. Thank you. Okay, let me just share my screen. I, mean, I, I, I can't um, advise you on, on how to do that. So, the, the okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, I think we can start with that. Uh, we should be able to see my slides now. Um, yeah, my slides so are coming. Thank you very much. much. It's okay. Dr. Nadia. Yeah. So, they. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so I'll speak to you today uh, about the interdisciplinary methodology for the MIHEL project. Um, and essentially, how did we um, execute it, the project that Raghu and Asha have spoken to you about? So from all the motivations, all the rationale for why we need to do this project and how we need to be culturally sensitive and inclusive, um, my talk is particularly about the practicalities of operationalizing all of that ethos um, and intention into a research project. So um, we have adopted an emancipatory research paradigm within our research, particularly looking at uh, participatory core research methodology. So we wanted to work um, in theater and storytelling to engage with communities, um, users, carers, um, and community members across the state in Kerala to um, connect with them to build trust, to build relationships, but also to collect data. Uh, so participatory research is a lot about conversations, about equal partnership and contribution to the research process, as opposed to us just coming in as uh, researchers with our own agenda and um, objectives. So we've conducted our research with immediately affected persons, as have been mentioned before. We thought it was important to highlight the lived experiences of service users, um, what they went to, how they've dealt with uh, mental illness, how that they've engaged with services, what kind of recovery um, pathways they've had, um, the experiences of their family members who are usually their carers, um, how did they support them, what kind of resources that did they have, um, what impact did having mental illness in the family had on them and their relationships, and also looking at the community as um, kind of a context within which uh, mental health and knowledge about mental health is is construed um, and importantly it was to highlight all of these voices because they're usually not heard not in clinical practice not in research so much um, 
so we wanted to do research with them, not on them, so to speak. Um, so this was our um, objective. Um, and the aim was to reconstruct their knowledge and ability in the process of understanding and empowerment. So through this participatory emancipatory um, research paradigm, we reach a different level of knowledge, a different level of confidence um, around mental health that wasn't there before. Um, so just to share what we mean by participatory research, um, I really like this uh, quote from Anu and Plato um, around participation in research and looking at it as a process in which ownership of the problem is increasingly shared between researchers and the researched. The first instance, researchers are likely to own the problem and design the research using methods that, are, that enable stakeholders to express themselves, working directly with stakeholders and gradually handing over responsibility to them to set the research agenda. Um, will change the role of researchers to facilitators and turn the research process into a joint project. And I feel like we have really succeeded in this uh, by using the creative methodologies that we, you will hear a lot more about tomorrow um, in the focus session um, in the first part. But also it's about um, sharing these experiences and uh, building a new knowledge on, on this um, through this partnership. Um, so what we've done is a multi-center study. So we've looked at four uh, specific locations in Kerala, in Palakkad, Kojakode, Malapuram, and Miraculum. Um, together, they constitute about 40% of the Keralan population. Uh, in each of these sites, we have selected a rural and an urban context. So we all together had eight primary research site that we work through um, continuously in the different engagement um, uh, and research activities. Um, so it's also always had to be equal across all of those locations. Uh, so we would get representation of various contexts, such as villages, for example, with farming communities, tribal colonies with low income levels and living standards, and equally towns and cities and higher income and living standards. Um, so here we we're learning about mental health literacy um, from different contexts, different perspectives, this different socioeconomic um, perspectives, religious, cultural, etc. cetera, um, understanding cultural variation within the state of Kerala. Um, so while the findings are applicable here, I think they will generalize as well. And we can look at the links you can make in other states in India um, because of the different factors that we have accounted for in in our, our context that we've looked at. So in terms of the project overview and some of these aspects have been highlighted to you already by Asha and Raghu, um, what I wanted to do in this slide is pull of them together and highlight how we've used mixed methods. So uh, your traditional qualitative and quantitative methods together with creative methodologies like theater, like film work um, to inform each other and to work together to engage with communities and produce these original insights and findings. So what we've done is we've started with storytelling. So again, we, we've wanted to learn from users, carers and community members about mental health, about their mental health literacy. So we've used narrative interviews okay. in um, the four uh, sites in Kerala, again, broken down by urban and rural context. Um, and altogether, we've collected quite a few, and I'll give you all of the numbers in terms of how many um, uh, in the next slide. So this was primary data collection. From there, we've worked with a theater group and theater practitioners on the team to create clinic plays um, to be uh, delivered within a clinical context across the eight um, sites. Um, again, they were engagement for the communities um, that have participated in the storytelling and other people in, within the community, but I also wanted to co-create new knowledge uh, to reflect with them on our findings and the themes that were coming out of the narratives to verify that we were not straying off their stories and we're actually keeping true to their intended meaning and relevance. And those clinic plays, I want to say, have been buried by context of the, the, the plays did reflect local religious and cultural um, idioms, vernacular uh, or important topics. 
based on that, based on the narrative themes, based on the clinic place discussions, we have um, started adapting a mental health literacy questionnaire. There is an existing questionnaire um, uh, in the literature that was mostly trialed in the West, but we wanted to adapt it to an Indian context. So we are careful in um, um, recreating, uh, again, the narratives and themes that we have learned from um, the, the participants in India and in Kerala. And we're still doing that so you can participate in some of that data collection yourself. At that point, COVID hit, so we're kind of halfway through the project. Um, we wanted to continue engaging with our communities, as Raghu have said, and we included film festival as part of that educational engagement and mental health literacy promotion process. Um, We've also, uh, in parallel to that, developed digital storytelling. Again, um, you can engage with those um, in the lobby and on our YouTube website. Um, we have used the stories that have been shared with us, again, by the participants in, in, uh, in our um, narrative interviews. And from there, again, we have developed the film scripts and the films that you can engage with as well. We wanted to do a play, but again, due to um, COVID context, we couldn't. Um, all of that work has fed into the MHLQ measurements, um, both in creating new items uh, as well as distributing MHLQ across the state and in India uh, for additional data collection for piloting. And we will be discussing some of that in a workshop um, in the afternoon today. So this is kind of the complexity of the project. All of these activities took uh, place uh, in about three years. Um, so what did we actually achieve? We got 192 interviews across the eight sites uh, with service users, carers, and community members. We have done eight clinic plays uh, in the locations um, of uh, where we were doing data collection. We have six digital stories. We had a film festival with over 500 submissions and with 20 then being shortlisted and evaluated by an esteemed panel. We have 18 films that you can view, uh, again, with subtitles. And MHLQ is going through a very detailed and laborious process of adaptation um, that we have over 300 in the first pilot. The team of researchers have done cognitive interviews in locations. Um, and now we're in a second level wave of piloting as well, looking at the links between the MHLQ that we have developed with recognized um, other constructs in mental health um, and well-being. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Radhya. Uh, it was very important uh, methodology that you talked about interdisciplinary and creative methodologies. I think psychology and humanities science, I think it, it is a new way, new pathway. And we have hope and scope that we can prevent mental health issues. That's what I am getting inside. But before we conclude, I have one more group, Dr. Amanda and Dr. Sanjana. Over to you. And you have, I think, if you try to wind up in minimum time, I'd be very happy because then we can take a few questions. No worries. We will try to sum this up um, and give a brief overview. So our presentation is going to build off of the same one um, that everyone's given today. Let me just share my screen. Yeah. All right. Is it easier for you to just share your screen? Sanjana, you are not audible. You are not audible, Sanjana. Yeah. So we'll be talking about um, the different interviews that were done with the mental health service users, family carers, and neighbor um, the perspectives. And these were in the urban, rural, and tribal communities. So again, just to reiterate that we did the interviews in the four sites. 
Um, we had villages, we had tribal colonies, we had towns and cities, and as mentioned, we interview individuals, their families, and their neighborhoods. Our overarching research question was answered through these interviews as well, so they were done to inform how we effectively can promote culturally appropriate mental health literacy in urban and rural communities using applied theater methodology. There are also some specific research questions that we can use the data and um, possibly with some of the other data that we have to triangulate. So we had how is mental health literacy shaped by economic, social and cultural context, which would have come out in the um, interviews. How do urban and rural communities construct culturally and socially appropriate meaning for mental health literacy? And how can we best engage with these communities to discuss poor mental health? As mentioned, this um, set of interviews answered the first or third objective, which was to develop narrative data sets on lived experiences. So most of the interviews were done in Malayalam and translated to English. We had a few that were done in English and a few that were done in Tamil as well. We used an open-ended and structured set of questions and the structured set had a participant particular framework. So participants' knowledge and awareness of mental health literacy, their causes, their knowledge of effective and acceptable sources of help, and further sources of information. Um, where applicable, we also looked at their experiences of how their families, friends, employers, and immediate community had social interactions with them. So looking at their attitudes, um, and we know that people's attitudes can influence mental health outcomes. So looking across the 192 interviews conducted, we had 24 urban, 24 caregivers, um, 24 community members. In the rule, we had 20 or 32 service users, 32 caregivers, and 32 community members. With the tribal site, we had eight service users, eight caregivers, and eight community members. Overall, we looked at biological sex, so we interviewed females and males, and we had predominantly females in the interviews. However, due to the migrant nature of men in um, the Carolyn state, I'm not surprised to see that we have an overabundance of females. We also know that females tend to take on the burden of care work, um, the majority. So looking across the different religions that we had, we had 122 Hindus, so we um, interviewed 54 Muslims and 11 Christians. So I'm going to pass over to um, Dr. Kumar, but before I do, I just want to celebrate both Sanjana and Archa's work on the interviews and doing the thematic analysis, which they tirelessly revised. Um, so over to you two, two ladies. Thank you so much, Amanda and, and the team. Um, so I will be talking about uh, the themes from urban and rural Kerala. So uh, when it comes to the Kerala context, uh, it's more of an urban-rural continuum rather than an urban-rural divide like in the other states of the country. And uh, as, as Ashanam have talked, uh, described you know, the accessibility, every village in, in Kerala is connected by motorable road. Now let's look at the different districts that we um, actually looked at. So let's start with Ernolum, uh, the urban Edapalli and the rural town of Chota Nikra, which is often famous for the, for the temple over there. And uh, this is the highest HDI. Now, on the other part of the spectrum, you have Malapuram, which is has the lowest HDI, and you have urban Ponani and rural Vailathur. And you can see that the themes in, in urban and rural Vailathur are pretty similar. The next district um, is Palakkad, and we have uh, uh, the Elipoli context. And Elipoli is, is located at, at, the, uh, at the junction of uh, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. So you have trades from both states. And finally, you have Calicut, where you have urban Calicut and rural Payori. Now, the knowledge and risk factors and causes uh, of mental health and mental illness are influenced by the socio-cultural milieu. And the interviewees in the urban context uh, attributed illness to biological, psycho psycho psychological, and social causes. Um, and it was seen that in urban areas, it was more uh, attributed to the biopsychosocial model. And you also had social causes like societal pressures, work issues, family atmosphere, and gulf migration. When it came to the more rural areas, what we saw, what we saw was uh, that they associated causation to uh, and of mental health primarily to God's destiny and supernatural causation. And you also saw an overarching theme of economic economic burden when it came to the rural sites. 
Now, uh, coming to the management of mental ill health, the psychiatric pluralism was evident in the narratives across the rural communities in the state. In our study, we found the choice of mental health care was based on awareness, accessibility, availability, and affordability of resources. Families of service users in the rural areas often resorted to multiple avenues of treatment at the same time or sequentially. It wasn't linear here. Rural participants they often endorsed for traditional methods, but they believed that taking psychiatric medicines along with religious observance will help them recover. Faith healers or religious healers emerged as the first line of management, and that was more culturally and religiously specific. Ayurvedic management was also mentioned in multiple accounts. Now, when it came to the urban, com urban communities, what we saw was that most of the participants spoke of the psychiatric management. They could differentiate between psychiatrists, psychologists, and doctors, and they also felt that medication along with therapy helped them go about their daily lives. Now, from this quote, you can see that most people, uh, they spoke of the importance of medication. But what we saw in specific to the rural sites was many people felt that recovery was, was, was stopping medication. So that was a common theme that we found in the rural context. Now, as has been described, mental health literacy is not only about mental illness, it's also about mental well-being. So looking at some of the social cultural strategies for well-being and coping, when we look at the more rural perspective, we found that prayer was an overarching theme. Prayer was the most important social cultural strategy for maintaining well-being, or it could be visiting religious institutions. And what we found in the, in the district of Malapuram was altruism, or just being good and doing good for people around you, emerged as a major theme. When it came to the more urban communities, uh, people spoke about you know engaging in hobbies, recreation, self-help was a big theme in these in the in, in the urban communities. And interestingly, several participants also spoke about how astrology and astrological predictions played a major role in making decisions. Now, what what makes Project Me so interesting was that we were looking at attitudes not only from a micro but also a macro perspective. So we had we were looking at both the community attitudes as well as what the family had to say about mental health and illness. So what the overarching theme was family was a source of support and stigma. Now, when we looked at the urban context, what we found stood out was a theme of autonomy and the importance of being in control. We found that service users often felt hopeless and helpless because they couldn't carry out their daily tasks. And the caregivers was stressed on the emotional burden that they had to face. Interestingly, when we looked at uh, the rural participants, autonomy wasn't that important to theme. And there was a kind of fatalistic acceptance of mental illness and a general air of uncertainty and fear. And in Elapoli, which was one of the rural districts, uh, intimate partner violence and substance abuse emerged as a prominent theme. Now, um, <clears throat> when it came to uh, families, as we said, families are a source of support and stigma. Service users often spoke about the, you know, the kind of And neighbors and all the common stereotypes that kind of emerge was that you know uh, it, you know that you cannot get married if you have mental illness mental illness cannot be cured social isolation and stigma were dominant themes and thus affected work prospects marriage and education so where do people get their knowledge about mental health now when it comes to the urban so what they get all the information but they weren't very sure whether it was the right information Change according to the larger community can be brought about by government policy, reform, helplines, and affordable care. And it was very important to start in schools and geriatric care. Now, when it came to uh, the rural community, a more collectivist society here, families and neighbors were viewed to be most helpful to service users. And religious organizations also stepped in. Now, since we did our study with, N with an NGO, and what we found was the NGO provided a lot of the mental health education for both service users and families. Thank you so much. I now, now pass it on to Archer. You're on mute, Archer. Mm. 
Yeah, we can't hear you. Archer, we can't hear you. Sanjana, we can't hear yes. you. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, so um, should should I continue? I think you should. Uh, let's complete so that we can start the question and answer. Yeah, sure. Only 18 minutes left. I will just. Uh, yes. Okay, so. Um, So Arch, uh, I will talk about the tribal community now and uh, the tribal narratives from users, carers, and communities. And the, we took the location of Attapadi. And Attapadi is, is located in the district of Palakkad and it's a rural hilly area. And uh, we, we it had a distinct section of its own because it's one of the least developed regions in Kerala with a liter literacy rate which is comparatively lesser than other regions in Kerala. And uh, there are mainly three tribes located in Attapadi, namely the Irula, Muduga, and the Kurumba. Now, coming to the explanations and management of mental illness in the tribal communities of Attapadi, again, we have the biopsychosocial cultural explanation when they spoke about you know, biological factors like heredity, old age, fear, again, the, the tension, the overthinking, and the death. But some of the specific kind of factors, the social factors that we found in this community was alcoholism. Many of the uh, service users and caregivers complained of, you know, the big problem of alcoholism. And there was also the, the problem of, you know, bad friendships and exposure to the city life because these were often isolated communities and now they were getting exposed to more urban life. And, and coming to the more cultural explanations uh, for illness, you have the natural elements in the environment and, you know, kind of food taken, possession, black magic in place of birth. Now, from the narratives, what we found was uh, there was a there was a, a shift of the healing method or methods from a more culturally followed practices to modern medicine and what we could call a turn from faith to medicine. And what were the culturally followed practices that we came across in our interviews? There were herbs, Ayurveda, black magic, religious practices, praying, visiting temples and threads. And, and in our narrative, we found that people were starting to move to more modern med medical methods, like consulting a doctor, you know, talking to people, and taking medications and injections. Stigma, just like in any part of, of the care, of part of Kerala, was very important. And uh, you know, users are not accepted. They laughed at, made fun, at, fun of, and there was also an internalizing of stigma that we found amongst the service users. But that was not the only challenge that was present in the tribal context. You know, people had trouble with the new kind of food that was available. So nutrition came across multiple times in our narrative interviews. And as we already discussed, substance abuse was a big problem. Alcohol. People wanted you know alcohol cessation pro pro uh, programs in the country, in the state. And there was also an educational backwardness which was seen in the community and, and a lack of support system. So this kind of, this quote kind of, uh, we would like to conclude by saying, this is what one of the community members had to say about uh, Atapadi. You teach the children about mental health and they understand it. When they grow up, they will teach it to others. So I guess this is a message that we have for all of you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Amanda and Dr. Sanjana and your team for giving us an insight to family care, how it happens. And one very important, before I, because we have less time, one important point which came from your presentation, Sanjana and Amanda, I must tell you that a family support system is very important, one. And two, that uh, your uh, data which reflected was more and rural, that's a good sign that uh, rural background people are interested to know about it. And that model can be replicated in many states. And I have that experience of one state, so I can tell you that. So that means how culturally conducive, according to the locality, we have to think creatively the methodology of mental health 
awareness and action program. That's one thing. And the concept of family mental health, I keep on saying, which you showed in the last slide, was very important. That how we create that concept of family mental health and we start to talk early to kids, children. And how do we do that in creative ways? Not telling them theories on mental health, which we read and study and get our degrees, but a very simple way, educating them, taking psychology to masses in a very simple term and giving them insight that there's something wrong. If I am coughing, I go to doctor. If I'm isolating myself, I need to see doctor as well. Another point you gave, uh, Sanjana, that uh, faith system. I think uh, we have no time right now. I could elaborate. There is one research which came out by a group of American psychologists at University, and they found in India, this research is uh, there available, biology of faith. And that's what I was correlating when I was listening to you, you in this context, that Indians, they have this very high regard for biology of faith, and they heal themselves. So finding on this research was that positive thinking is one name of uh, many among many gods which we have in, in our country. So that was the conclusive statement by psychologists given in this. And then I'm relating to your study, which you have found. So I think how it can really work along with the alternative therapies and medication Time has come that indigenous approach needs to be inculcated in the cultural conducive way, local, local context as well to be taken care of. And also one practitioner in Delhi, a psychiatrist, he keeps on saying that meditation is to merge with medication. The time has come. So I'm listening to all of you. I'm reminded of that statement. Yeah, time has come that meditation needs to merge with medication so all indian techniques we have which is a lot of data scientific verified data so before i think uh, uh, without uh, discussing on that i have tried to give points after every talk so that i uh, manage my time i straight away go to the question uh, uh, professor rahu is that okay because we can manage time that way we have two important questions uh, for I think Dr. Nadia, if I can say, do you have an example yeah. of how the MLQ was amended and has a more uh, Western uh, context? The question again, you see in the question chat. Yeah, I can see that. Thank you. So we went through quite a laborious process um, of adapting it, but the one thing that we have added um, that was quite significant is reflection of this uh, spiritual and cultural practice around uh, understanding the causes of mental illness as well as the options for treatment and recovery. Um, so if you do engage with the MHLQ, for example, in the lobby, you will come across those items that um, qu ask questions around um, the role of spirituality and religious practice for recovery, for example. Um, this was such an important theme in the narratives that we could not ignore it in, in the MHLQ, where the original context for, this, for the items was, of course, the kind of Western biomedical model of understanding, you know, definitions of mental illness according to the DSM, for example, um, which is Fair enough, Fair enough, but not necessarily as meaningful within, you know, villages and cities um, in India. Uh, so we wanted to adapt it to um, to things that were important, and that's why we've reflected that in in the scale. And you will be able to see that if you do take it um, as part of this conference. So. Yeah. Would you like to add, Professor? Abu? I have nothing more to add to that. I think I have what, one of the things that you have mentioned earlier on is that the whole you know, the family model of mental health is something that we should be looking at. And also you gave me a very valid point in your, in your um, discussion is the kind of medication versus meditation. And I think I can see something in that, a kind of major dimension. Because, because I think that, you know, 
um, because it is important to actually have uh, sleep, mental ill health uh, through medication. We are not discounting that, but I think it's important to actually have a look at explore other ways of doing things. And I think it's uh, from from a professor Asher's inaugural um, you know, from the talking perspective. He, he mentioned about the kind of social cultural model of mental ill health and how that needs to be progressed. So I think we need to be focusing much on the family model of young young people's mental health. Yeah. Over, uh, next question we have, what is the provision in law for disclosure of mental issues in the workplace and in marriage? So who will take this question? Dr. Nadia or Professor Asha, would you like to take this question? Um, see, the question, the question in itself is not clear. Are you asking whether there is provision in law for disclosure? I don't think yeah. so. Any law can because there is a when we are looking at rights perspective. It's uh, you know a, you know right to confidentiality is there, so no law can enforce that disclosure is needed. And are we going to ask for disclosure of physical health concerns? as well so i take it at that and there is there you know uh, like in the indian uh, your, you know marriage law yes it's on the grounds of insanity and incurability mental illness becomes a ground for divorce but recently judiciary is much more sensitive that they do not grant divorce rather they ask the spouse or the caregiver to take the person for treatment. So the judiciary, the level of work at the judiciary also is happening. So it is like draconian, like several decades before somebody said incurable. So then that cannot continue. So thankfully over the years when we see judiciary is also amending their ways of, uh, you know, uh, granting divorce decrees. So this is my thought. Yeah, I mean, yeah. sentiment has already yeah. Gave this that uh, the, this mental health is not the ground for divorce. I think there's one judgment which came out. So you're right. The judiciary is becoming sensitive sensitive towards this mental health issue. But I have a question to all panelists. If I'm supposed to prevent a mental health problem, I need to screen. Why we get a physical health uh, screened so that we take care of our health before 40, 50, 60, so that we don't we identify ailments early and take a proactive steps and when it comes to mental health we are not allowed to screen also i have tried my attempt a lot of time in universities they said if i know then i'll not take the students for admission i said why it is helpful if he's in not his intelligent his marks are good we can provide that help to the student but we are afraid so we have to bring some changes in our thinking for disclosure if we can disclose, if I'm a diabetic, I'm a heart patient, I can't disclose that I have depression. But now many people are doing it. But how do we take this as a challenge as a mental health professional group? That if you ask me, Professor Raghu and all panelists, I would start screening process at every place, school, college, university, workplace, and try to help those people if I'm screening for my employees. Why not? If they are good in their work, I had one of my secretary, she was doing working with me. She had problem. Many of my committee said, no, you have to throw her out. Well, no, I will not. She was very good in her certain skills. I managed her and I said, this is nothing bad. You know, if some, somebody is having some problem, if I know and she has been inducted unknowingly, now you have been known about because of her behavioral issues. Now you're saying throw her out. Is it justified? So I think I'm giving a food for thought for everybody. I would say disclosure, we can do it as we do for other ailments. But what is the provision to help me if I disclose? You know, if I, I lose my job, I lose my admission. That's and I lose my career. I don't know. I think I don't I, have I, one I'm raising this I question. want to respond to this. It should be other way. It should not be testing first. It should be workplace mental health policy first. Yeah. What I'm not guaranteeing whether I'm safe in my workplace. What are some of the inclusive affirmative practices in my workspace? Yeah. So creative that conducive culture will enable me to come and disclose. If it happens testing first, then there is no mechanism or policy to protect my rights. 
then I will be in jeopardy. So it no, should be like. Yeah, obviously, yeah. Yes, Asha, without policy, even disclosure cannot happen and screening yeah. cannot happen. Because if I am screening, I have to tell other people there's a policy, you know, that policy has to be good. I started with my talk that we need to have a policy yeah. on mental health. The new kind of mental health issues are also coming, you know, if you ask me. Yeah. So I think there's another question, Professor Raghu. I think if I can read, uh, can we have a screen in a bigger form? I was, can we have that question next? Professor Raghu, I was concerned about attitudes of young mental health professionals. How can this be tackled so they don't further stigmatize patients? Well, um, I think the, the way it was to address this has to be from a from a very broad perspective. I think we need to we need to kind of enlighten and we need to educate and provide the information for young people. And I think just providing um, the various conditions. I think at the moment, what we actually do for young people in terms of education um, is that you just provide what is anxiety, what is stress, what is depression. I mean, that is that is only one part of it. And I think we should be focusing more on the mental health. How do we how is it that we create mental health? And I think when I talk to students in India, they all give me when I ask about the definition of mental health, they all give me a definition of mental ill health. So there is a gap of understanding what is mental health and what is mental ill health. So I think from a young people perspective, and I think how is it that us together, academics, researchers, um, NGOs, policymakers, how do we all come together? Can How can we make mental health champions, young mental health champions in our schools, in our universities? Uh, and I think that should be the kind of case. There's no one model that fits all. That could be diverse models as to how we propagate that. And I think that is the richness of it. We should not be going for a one unified model of doing it. There are different ways of doing it. One of the examples that we have actually shown is how we can engage engage with community through theater, films, and storytelling. There could be X number of other, other ways in which it could be done. But I think the focus should be on building the abilities, the inner capacities, building the resilience and well-being. Yeah. So next question, again, can we have that next question? Child mental health. The last one I think we can take. Child mental health. Needs are not prioritized as urgent. Did, did you find any in your work as well? Yes. Who will take this, Anjana? Yes, we did. Uh, so most a uh, lot of uh, community members uh, spoke about this need, and even during our plays, when we had clinic plays in uh, in with the community, this is one of the major issues that people spoke about. So the need for you know care to start young at a young age okay so thank you all panelists and this was a good deliberation and good presentation scientific presentation by all i don't have much time to say anything but one word which i gathered based on your interaction that we need to come out with ccpm model that is culturally community based model for mental health literacy and action program. And we can do it together, we can make difference. So thank you all. Greetings of peace and happiness to all panelists and all participants. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.